Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this session. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Simon Elliott, uh, and I'm part of the investment trust team at JP Morgan Asset Management. So the title of the session today is to have your cake and eat it. Uh, as it says behind me, targeting both income and growth. And I'm delighted to be joined today by three portfolio managers representing three different trusts and investing in three different asset classes. So to introduce them all in turn, I have on my right uh, William Meaden, who's the co-manager of J.P. Morgan Claverhouse. I have on the far side there Alexander Fitzalan Howard, the co-manager of the J.P. Morgan European Growth and Income Fund. And we also have Isaac Thong, uh, the co-manager of J.P. Morgan Global Emerging Markets Income. Um, so we don't go for short titles at J.P. Morgan. Um, but over the next 20 minutes or so, um, we'll run you through how each trust generates its dividend and how the investment trust structure provides advantages in doing that. So we're going to start with William. And as mentioned, he's been the manager of J.P. Morgan Claver House since about 2012. But Will, your trust has a yield of 5.2% at present. How is that generated? Thanks, Simon. Morning, everybody. Um, so J.P. Morgan Claver House is a £450 million pound investment trust, which yields just over 5%. And it has increased its dividend every year for the last 51 years. Now, how do we uh, achieve that? There's, there's two things that we do that, that, that helps us deliver that enviable dividend track record. The first is that we invest solely in UK equities. It's a portfolio of some 60 to 80 stocks. Unlike most of our competitors in the income and growth sector, we invest in what has historically been a pretty unloved market, the UK equity market. <clears throat> but as you can see on the right-hand side, the UK equity market yields so much more than any other developed market. And what we've done here is not just show the cash dividend yield that you get from the UK, which is the, the, the black bar. Uh, we also have added in the, the, the share buybacks, which are an increasing feature of many markets. So they add another return to shareholders. So if you add the share buybacks and the cash dividend yield, the UK market is yielding some 6.3%. So we invest solely in UK equities. My co-manager, Callum Abbott, and I look for the very best uh, UK equities, which have a good dividend yield, which have a sustainable, visible dividend yield through strong balance sheets, good market share, good management, and so forth. And that really gives us a good leg up in terms of that, uh, that dividend income. But there's a second thing that, that we do, or should I say that the board does, which to help us deliver that very good, consistent dividend track record, that 51 consecutive years. And that's the judicious use of revenue reserves. Now, I'm sure most of you know that, that investment trusts, particularly for income investors, have this wonderful advantage over open-ended funds in that they are allowed to tuck some income away when dividends are plentiful into reserves to be drawn back when dividends are less plentiful in the UK market. So up to 15% of income every year can be tucked away by the board into revenue reserves. And then when there isn't much income around, those reserves are released to help give that consecutive dividend increase. So the, com and that, the, the result of investing in high yielding quality UK equities, judicious use of reserves by the board gives that smooth line that you see for Claver House. So 2008, if you had 100 pounds of income from Claver House, that is more than double. That's now worth 210 pounds. And as you can see, that's ahead of both the CPI, inflation, 155, and also ahead of the UK market if you just bought an open-ended index fund. And you can also see that that income from just buying an index fund is so much lumpier. There are good years and then very bad years when dividends are cut. So it's that combination of UK quality, high yielding UK equities, judicious use of reserves, which gives that track record that we've established. And, and Will, it's probably worth just touching on how the dividend decision is made because ultimately it's not in your gift, it's, it's done by the board. Can you just run through how that works? It is, so, so uh, my job, my co-manager's job, Callum Abbott, is to deliver the income and then we meet with the board four or five times a year. In fact, we've got a board meeting on, on Monday. And then the board have a detailed analysis from us as to what income we've achieved to date. We're at December year end. 
and what our forecast is that we think we're going to achieve over the rest of the year. And they pay four quarterly dividends, the final one being the swing, swing factor, the one that's paid for the fourth quarter, the, the December quarter, and that's the one that determines the dividend for the year when you aggregate all those four dividends together. But you're quite right, that's a board decision rather than our decision. But they, I suspect given the, the dividend hero status, they will be quite mindful of that in when they come to make their decisions. Yes, I mean, I don't, I don't think any manager or, or, or board of, of Claver House wants to be the first one to break that record. Uh, and we have got these great reserves tucked away. We've got almost a year's worth of reserves. So that, we, obviously, we can't guarantee it, but it gives a high degree of probability that we can keep that record going for the foreseeable future, at least. Let's turn to emerging markets now. And Isaac, I mean, emerging markets have not historically been associated with dividends, and yet your investment trust, the Global Emerging Markets Income Fund, has a yield of over 4% at the moment. How's that achieved? Well, the, the truth is emerging markets offer a very sizable amount of dividend. In fact, the dividend of about 3% right now is among the best globally. But when you think about emerging markets and when investors think about emerging markets, the first word that really comes to mind is growth. Emerging markets have growth. But unfortunately, another word comes quickly after, and that is risk. So emerging markets have a decent amount of risk as well. So for us in our trust, we aim to capture the strong potential of emerging markets through a nice mixture, a prudent mixture of income and growth. So how do we do that for the trust? Well, we predominantly invest in high quality dividend franchises across a whole range of dividend yields that you could see on the chart. Right? And so for, for us in general, the lower the dividend yield, the higher our requirements are for business quality and earnings growth. And when I mention business quality, what I really mean is a company's ability to generate high returns on capital over a long period of time. So with that out of the way, let me give you two very pertinent examples, both of which we own for the trust right now. So the first example is a low yielding stock called TCS, or Tata Consultancy Services, based out of India. This is a very high quality business in our view and it only yields us a very pedestrian 3% cash dividends. So why do we invest in this stock? Well, that's because we envisage that Tata Consulting Services will continue to grow and compound earnings by 9% per year over the next five years. So compare and contrast that to a high yielder that we own as well, Siam Commercial Bank, based out of Thailand. This leading Thai bank yields a very chunky and very attractive 10% cash dividend yield. However, when you look at its earnings growth outlook, we forecast that SCB will only compound earnings at 4% per year over the next five years. So two very different investment propositions, but essentially what we are saying is that SCB's chunky dividend yield compensates you for the slightly lower quality of its business and its lower earnings growth profile. So we achieve, and these are two examples of how we achieve a very balanced yield profile across the fund. Well, if you look at emerging markets, very broadly speaking, we do tend to find high quality dividend franchises in three key areas. That is IT, financials, and consumer. So these types of companies are the ones where we invest the majority of our trust assets in, and the resultant portfolio is one that has a yield that's much higher than the benchmark. The yield right now from the trust stands at 4.7%, compared to 3% on the benchmark, and the portfolio also has an average earnings growth of 9%. So once again, a very healthy mix of current income and future growth. The trust also uses, like most other trusts, we employ a healthy amount of Hearing at about 6%. We have, we have used this predominantly to boost uh, the dividend yield for you. And we, we envisage maintaining the 6% um, over long periods of time. Where it comes to issues like emerging market currency risk, a very pertinent risk out there, we are super cognizant of this risk and we manage it from a portfolio level by, by ensuring that we don't take oversized positions in countries that have historically had very um, volatile currencies. So, so those, for example, of the Fragile Five, 
which are India, Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa, and Turkey. Our holdings are also very diversified at an individual level, and this, in our experience, helps us mitigate the, the specific currency risk out there. So I've said a bit, and I'll summarize. The Emerging Market Investment Trust essentially tries to capture the vast potential of emerging markets in a prudent way by investing in high-quality dividend franchises, delivering you a very healthy mix of income and growth. And Isaac, just to follow up on that, when you look at emerging markets, obviously there's a whole range of countries within that universe. Does the fact that you deploy an, an income-focused strategy mean that you are more attracted to certain markets than others? Are there some markets that just don't work from a dividend point of view? Well, definitely the one that does not quite work for, from a dividend point of view is India, and you know, for good reason. Firstly, um, you know, there's a lot of growth opportunity in India right now, and secondly, the market has already paid up for it. So when you look at dividend payout ratios in India, they're pretty low. And coupled with high valuations, you have a country that has very low dividend yield. Uh, so we are underweight India on a structural basis. Um, but, but that doesn't mean we don't own India at all. Um, I mentioned at the start our investment in TCS. Well, that's an Indian company, and we are involved in some um, Indian, other Indian IT services companies like Infosys as well that give dividend yields of about 3%. So very selective. We also own uh, financials in, in India that have about 2% dividend yield. So we do have some Indian companies in the fund, but we are not going to you know, sort of plug a gap in the market and the, you know, by investing in all sorts of companies. We stick to our process and we're invested in those individual companies that suit the income process. That's great. Right, last but not least, there's Alexander. And Alexander, you're the co-manager of the JP Morgan European Growth and Income Fund. That pays an enhanced dividend, so slightly different. Can you explain how that works, please? Yes, of course. And uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for, for coming along. Um, European Growth and Income Trust has taken a rather different approach to the other two uh, trusts that you've heard about. There, the board have decided that they will pay a dividend of 4% of the NAV set at the end of the pr previous financial year. So that's the end of March. And then they will pay that out quarterly uh, in the year following. There are a few sort of quite important consequences of that. Um, first of all, it means that we can invest on a total return basis. We're not um, seeking to generate that 4% from the dividend yield within the portfolio. If necessary, the board will use the reserves, as William described for his fund, use the reserves um, to top up the dividend to pay that 4%. So it's really using that investment trust structure. You wouldn't be able to do that in an open-ended fund. There are a couple of sort of important investment things that follow from that too. It means that we're not obliged to chase yield in the market. We don't have to invest in some of the more sort of moribund or stranded assets like maybe tobacco or oil and gas in order to generate yield. The flip side of that is that we can invest in genuine growth companies in Europe. And just to give you a couple of examples of stocks that we hold at the moment, and you'll, you probably know them well anyway, one is Novo Nordisk, the big Danish um, pharmaceutical company, focuses on diabetes and following on from that, weight loss. And uh, sadly, this is a massive market across the world and um, Novo Nordisk is incredibly well placed for that. It, it really is a, you know, a genuine growth company. Another one is ASML, which makes uh, leading edge machines for the production of semiconductor chips. And within Europe, it's one of the few ways that you can really play the AI boom, the artificial intelligence boom that you will all know has been going on in America. So it allows us access to all these sorts of companies where we don't have to worry about what the dividend is from, from those companies. So it means, in a sense, that you, as investors, you get your 4% yield on the one side, but we're not compromising what's going on on the growth side either. It's a case, really, of having the best of both worlds. And just to illustrate that point, we've put the, 
the, the chart up here of the performance of the investment trust over the, the last 10 years or so, just to illustrate that point. Just picking up on, on Europe in general, though, I mean, clearly, for a lot of people based in the UK, they might look at Europe and look at the political um, uh, developments there. They might look at the macro news coming out and think, is Europe really an interesting destination from an investment point of view? Is that a misconception? Is that a valid point? Uh, I think not at all. I think the prospects for Europe are fantastic. And you mentioned politics. I'm not sure we want to look at our domestic politics too much at the moment. Um, but if you look at Europe on a wider scale, inflation is coming down. Um, consumer confidence has really started to pick up. Um, real incomes, real wages have, have turned positive. So um, the consumer side of the economy is looking very positive. On the manufacturing side, some bits of Europe are quite difficult. Germany, for example, with the, you know, when the Russian gas got cut off. That's starting to bottom out now, and we're starting to see manufacturing orders pick up. Um, valuations are incredibly cheap in Europe, uh, not only against Europe's own history, but in particular against the US. And lastly, I've, money is starting to flow back into Europe, um, which is, a, you know, is fantastic. So I think the prospects for Europe are very good. And for the trust in particular, it's important because if we can grow the NAV, then the income will go up automatically because it's set against the NAV. So I think the prospects for Europe are great. There we go. So um, I'm just going to flick on a slide here. That's the, the, the performance on a calendar year basis. But just to open this up a little bit, I mean, income is, is one thing, but income growth is another matter as well. And when you look at your respective asset classes, how do you see the prospects over the medium long term for uh, revenue coming through? So the underlying dividend growth. I'll start with you, William, on that. Um, I, think, I think for the foreseeable future, I think from the UK market, you can expect some five, six, seven percent. It's difficult to be exact, but I think one should have in one's mind that sort of number. With inflation falling to the Chancellor said in his budget, he thinks it's going to be two percent anytime soon. That, that, that's, that's quite attractive, that, that, that growth rate. Um, I think there's a prospect of interest rate cuts. I think balance sheets are strong in the UK. And what we've been waiting for for a long time, you're starting to see some takeovers in the UK. And as a UK manager, I've been arguing for years, the UK market is cheap. You're actually starting to see corporates put their money where their mouth is now. And you've seen bids come in for Curry's, Spirant at 60% premium. You know, these, these are the, the, the UK market is looking very attractive on a dividend yield basis and the potential for growth as well. But I think Claverhouse should at least match that, I think, and give dividend growth for some 5 6% uh, over the foreseeable few years. And, and Isaac, in terms of emerging markets, are you seeing similar kind of levels of underlying dividend growth? Well, I think in emerging markets, growth has never really been an issue. There's growth everywhere. And I think my point was just trying to tap that growth in a responsible and prudent way. Um, if you take out China from the equation, which is struggling economically at the moment, the rest of emerging markets uh, offer very decent growth opportunities. So emerging markets are what I would call a dividend payout driven market. So dividend payout ratio has been about 35% over long periods of time. Hence, uh, earnings growth really matters in emerging markets. And if you look at the, the trust, like I mentioned, um, you know, we, we anticipate earnings to grow on average about 9% per annum over the next five years. So that would translate to a, a dividend growth rate because we believe that the companies we choose have very sound dividend policies and are not going to cut the payout ratios. So that's the kind of high single digit prospect we're, we're seeing for dividend growth. And Alexander, obviously, as discussed, you're, you're agnostic whether a, uh, a company pays a dividend or not, or not. But is it something that you, you encourage? Uh, do you think it's a, a sign of good corporate governance? Or how do, you, how do you look at it? I think for us, we're very keen that companies return cash to shareholders, basically. But we're completely agnostic as to whether that comes in the form of dividend or share buyback. Um, I think we just prefer companies that return the money to shareholders rather than go on big you know, acquisition sprees. And um, not only Europe, but I think around the world, the market's littered with companies that have destroyed a lot of value by making acquisitions that have not gone as they first thought they would. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have uh, time for today. But hopefully you've seen that it is possible uh, to have your cake and, and eat it even 
uh, through investment and targeting capital and income. But if you do have any questions for our portfolio managers, all three will be available on the JP Morgan Asset Management stand hereafter. I think there's even a tale of some cake uh, being available for the first uh, 20 or 30 people who, who get down there. Um, you'll also be able to find some research reports and other materials on the respective investment trusts. But thank you very much for your time today and do have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.